I am just really excited. I'm delighted to have the chance to speak with Kristen Russo. Kristen is a co-founder, along with Danielle Owens-Reed, of Everyone is Gay, which works to improve the lives of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and questioning queer youth using a three-pronged approach. They provide honest advice to kids while keeping them laughing, talking to students across the country in an effort to create caring, compassionate school environments, and they also importantly work with parents of LGBTQ kids to help foster an ongoing dialogue and a deeper understanding of life. So Kristen, hi there. It's just great to have a chance to talk to you today. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. So like the first thing I wanted to ask you is uh, you're, you're working in a communications medium that to me is not just old school but was like really moribund. It's the old advice column and as somebody from the baby boom generation I sort of know about it through Dear Abby and Ann Landers and yet you and Danielle have really transformed that and you've made it fresh and fun and real and I'm wondering did you have to evolve towards that? It obviously reflects your personalities but was it like that day one like this big bang and you completely reinvented that genre? <laughs> well um, when we started the site and started giving advice our main objective was to be fun and funny. Um, we really didn't have any concept of the fact that we would slowly begin to take on serious questions and address them in a way that incorporated you know lightheartedness in ways that hadn't been used before so um, that's kind of the first part of the answer but the second part is you know I, I don't know that we completely reinvented the wheel. I spent um, when I when I first moved to New York City in 2000 I would pick up the Village Voice as often as I could so that I could read um, Dan Savage's column, which was in the Village Voice at the time. And, um, you know, his columns were hilarious and brutally honest and, you know, had a very different tone than ours did, but really, I think, informed the way that I approached my writing in some sense, um, you know, to, to know that I could say what I was feeling and to also be able to make people laugh about issues that might not be always hilarious to everyone. But it's so important to inject that because you're dealing with really serious issues, uh, life and death issues in some cases, and uh, to, to have credibility and to be able to connect with people that you don't know otherwise, I think it, it's just so important. That's really one of my questions too because you seem to be so on point all the time and yet practically speaking, all you know about these people is what you have in, in their question. How do you deal with that, that you know so little and you're dealing with such serious issues that touch the lives uh, generally of these young people who are, are trying to find themselves uh, in terms of their sexual orientation and or gender identity. Um, I think that Danielle and I have both approached this the same way since day one, which is that we've lived our lives and we have experience from having lived those lives and obviously both of us pull from some other places. You know, I have a master's degree in gender studies and so that informs some of the way that I write and some of the way that I communicate, but what we've found and what I think our entire movement is hinged on is that so many of these issues, as serious as they are in so many cases, really hinge on universal human needs. That, um, you know, that kid who is terrified to come out to his parents because he thinks he might get kicked out of his house, he isn't sure about X, Y, Z. Yeah, there are specifics, and those specifics are rooted in sexuality, but at the end of the day, most of us can understand what it is to have parents and what it is to be afraid of what your parents might think about a, a particular facet of your life. So that's just really informed us, and it's really propelled us forward in just sort of accessing our own like human experience and talking about it as clearly and concisely as we can. And also, uh, you call your project Everyone is Gay, which is a self-evident truth. Everybody knows that that's true, but I think it's cool <laughs> that you came up with that. And, and what exactly do you mean when you say every, everyone is gay? Well, um, complete transparency. When we named the website, it was just a website. We didn't know it was going to turn into an organization. Just and a website at first? Or, you know? Yeah, we started as a Tumblr. Um, we started as a Tumblr, and um, Danielle and I g-chatted one day and said to each other, we should name it this funny thing or that other funny thing, and at the same moment she said, no one is straight, and I said, everyone is gay, and then I got on the subway, and when I got above ground, she had texted me and said, it's up, I, I launched it, it's called Everyone is Gay, and so at first, it was just supposed to be funny, like tongue-in-cheek, everyone's gay. 
Um, but now, and this is kind of ties into what I was just saying, um, really what we noticed is that if we take out that part of the question, like what I was just saying to you, you know, if somebody comes to us and they say, I came out to my friends as trans and they're being super supportive, but I don't know that they really understand it and I feel misunderstood. It's like, all right, so let's say everyone is trans, right? Let's say everyone is gay in the case of the, the kid who had just who didn't want to come out to his parents. And what are you asking? You're really asking um, for the approval of your parents, for the acceptance and understanding of your friends. And so that's really what that name has come to mean to us now. Um, but in its inception, it was just for laughs. <laughs> What's interesting to me, though, is that you're uh, really addressing the same kind of point that I'm trying to address with the phrase the human agenda uh, for this project. The human agenda is actually an ironic commentary on the old hate speech phrase, the homosexual agenda. When I tweet about that, I'll say, you know, the, the homosexual agenda is the human agenda. It's life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In other words, we're all people. We're all looking to achieve the same goals. And I say the same thing about the transgender agenda is, is the human agenda. And so I think it's finding that common ground that provides an opportunity to communicate and to understand, particularly on issues of gender identity, you know, which it disturbs me deeply, are still so little understood. I think uh, even less understood than sexual orientation. Would you agree uh, with that? Oh, absolutely, wholeheartedly. I mean, I think that um, trans rights and trans issues are just now beginning to get um, the attention that they have deserved for a long time, and I think there's a really, really long road ahead for um, the recognition and understanding of the trans experience. Well, in fact, uh, a little later today, I'm going to be speaking as part of this project with Ian Harvey, who's a trans man stand-up comedian, and part of his, he talks about himself in his act just as you and Danielle use your own lives in giving advice, and he said, you know, I had to come out twice to my parents, first to say, you know something, I, I like girls, and then a few years later, well, mom and dad, I still like girls, but guess what, I want to be a dude. <laughs> so... There was like a coming out twice in, in his particular case. And, you know, you do have to think, what was that like for his parents just as much as what was that like for him? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's an issue that I think is, is very difficult to address. What about, though, that whole issue of coming out and, and of families? You've started the Parents Project. I, I really would like to get an understanding from you about the extent to which you think families maybe are more supportive than they used to be when their kids come out, whether from a, a sexual orientation or gender identity standpoint. I mean, you've really spoken to tens of thousands of young people at, at this point and are in touch with parents and are, are traveling. Uh, you know, if you were to take the pulse right now of what it is like in, in families and what it is like for kids to come out, what would you say? You know, I think that um, there's definitely a difference, um, mostly in the knowledge category when it comes to parents. I think since I've since I came out to my parents, you know, I don't know, God, 15 years ago or something like that. Um, I think there are more parents who are a bit more educated on what life might look like for their LGBTQ kid in the future. So I think that helps. But um, in terms of taking the pulse of the young people who have to do the coming out, it doesn't seem different at all. The fear and the uncertainty and the confusion about how to talk about this with parents is as present and identical to how it was you know, 15 years ago, I, I think, in my experience. Um, we have so many young people who when they talk about their parents, it, it, it's very plain that their parents are very accepting, very open-minded, but they're just terrified. So many kids think that even though their parents are open-minded and understand issues, it will be different when it's their kid. And so that fear is still really, really alive in, in the lives of many young people. Well, I would think that that would be a fundamental issue for caring, loving parents, that if you hear that your child is uh, gay or lesbian, transgender, you're going to worry about them being persecuted for that, uh, being bullied at school. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you deal with that whole issue, both from a, a kid perspective and a parent perspective, the whole issue of bullying? Well, you know, that's, that's a really, really tricky question to unpack. And in um, Danielle and I have a, a book for parents as well that's sort of hand-in-hand hand with the Parents Project, and it comes out this fall, and it was our first foray into really talking about bullying and trying to talk about bullying for from a parent's perspective. And so many of the things that I read online were 
you know, logically on paper they seem to make sense. Like these are the steps that you take and you should make sure that like XYZ knows. And in some cases, maybe you have a great school administration and maybe they know exactly how to handle the situation and maybe those steps will work. But it seemed like there was a lot of the reality missing. The fact that you're going to have some serious fears and feelings about this. The fact that your kid might not want you to approach administration. Um, and so I would say to a parent who's dealing with that, the first step is always to talk to your kid. Because your kid is on the front lines, right? Your kid is the one that's in that school and they know they know the teachers who are going to be their allies. They know the teachers who are not. And and I think being able to have an open dialogue, as open as possible with your kid, is always the first step. If you're afraid that your kid is in danger and your kid won't talk to you, then obviously you have to take uh, action on your own. But I think a lot of parents kind of discredit the knowledge that their kids have about what's going on in that situation and go right to you know, administration or teachers or things like that. I think it's important to start with the young person first. Well, I think what's disturbing, though, too, is that uh, bullying goes on throughout life, right? For people in the LGBTQIA community. I did a piece for the Huffington Post focused on uh, transgender women called That's a Man. And it had to do with the fact that it's really literally still dangerous to walk down the street, even in a progressive city like New York City. There was a transgender woman killed in Harlem, uh, murdered uh, this past summer. And uh, Mayor Bloomberg came out and said that although hate crimes were significantly reduced, they had more than doubled with respect to the LGBTQIA community and so you have these issues continuing throughout life and for that reason they're just so uh, difficult to, to deal with. Do you find uh, apart from family that a lot of the kids you're dealing with do have peers at least that they can talk to? Uh, do they have outlets uh, to confide you know their their feelings about themselves and uh, their, their hopes and their fears? A lot of them do. Um, I think that you know the presence of things like gay straight alliances in middle schools and high schools is much higher than it was, you know, 10, 20 years ago. And um, more than that, you know, we're seeing more more of a presence of queer characters in television and in movies. So there's more ability for young people to dialogue with their peers about some of these things. But I think that. Um, the presence of the internet is really one of the biggest steps in allowing young people to talk about their questions and their fears because even knowing that like your friends maybe accept you and you've come out as bisexual and everything's cool it doesn't really give you a complete outlet as any of us know just from being young to to ask the questions you really have because you feel silly or you feel like maybe you're supposed to know already and so I think that the space of the internet being able to google things and find you know tumblr is a huge huge community um, with people answering questions for each other and you can ask things anonymously and there's just such a community there that I think bridges what is lacking with peer-to-peer -peer conversations. I mentioned the Parents Project earlier. This is a newer project, um, and I think that there are other iterations of it that are forthcoming. Could you just talk a little bit about that, your focus on parents? Sure, absolutely. Um, it was sort of a no-brainer for us to make the next step of Everyone is Gay be dialogue with parents whose kids had just come out to them, so many of the questions that we get, both through our site and when we go to tour you know, schools, when kids approach us, you know, at the merch table, their questions are almost exclusively um, about either heartbreak and relationship or their parents and coming out to their parents or explaining terminology to their parents. Um, you know, a parent might understand what gay means. They might have no idea what the term queer means or gender queer or, you know, there, there are a lot of terms and parents are are trying to keep up, I think, in a lot of cases, and also we're struggling with some of the like age-old questions, you know, is this my fault? Did I as a parent do something wrong to cause my child to be gay? And um, after Danielle and I talked about it a bit, we decided we would try to put our resources together and our own experience with our families um, together and write a book. And that's where things began, is in the writing of this book, which comes out in the fall of 2014. Um, it's called This is a Book for Parents of Gay Kids. Um, so it's pretty pretty straightforward title there. And um, in the book, there's a resources section. And when we looked online for resources for parents, 
um, we didn't find much. You know, PFLAG has a great presence um, within communities especially, but other than that, there wasn't a strong presence of videos and collected advice for parents who had these pretty common questions. And so we decided we would create it because we wanted to be able to put something in the back of the book for parents to find online, and uh, that's where the Parents Project was born. So it will be... Um, you know, a site that contains articles from experts, advice from Danielle and I, advice from other parents, and also uh, conversations with youth and coming out stories and things like that, and a, a large video library that we'll, that we'll be building as well um, for parents. Well, I checked out your book, and um, it turns out you can pre-order it. I just did on Amazon, so I would recommend that everybody go out and do that. Now, there's going to be an associate you YouTube channel. Yes, you can. I'm go already making money off of it. At least, uh, yeah, I, I signed up for like 14 bucks or something like that to uh, to buy it. Uh, on Amazon, you can pre-order stuff that's already listed. But uh, it, there's going to be a YouTube channel too, is that right? Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. there will be. There will be a YouTube channel that our um, advice video is from Danielle and I, and we're also working with some other people in the community. Um, a friend of ours, Lauren, identifies as trans, and so they're doing um, a bunch of advice questions in video format um, that are more related to trans issues. And um, so, yeah, it's all it, it's all going to be either video or text to begin with, and then there'll be um, a pretty extensive resources section as well for parents to you know continue the conversation if they want and find things in their local community. Things like, things like that. You mentioned the word queer a moment ago, and I wanted to just talk a little bit about the language of self-identification because, of course, it's self-validating. I wonder what your point of view is, though, on the use of the word queer, which seems not only to refer to sexual orientation in some cases, but to gender identity. Do you think that that word is being successfully reinvented, and do you think that it's being used clearly? Because I I have a PhD in English, and I have to be quite honest, I find that it's used by different people in different ways all the time, and I find myself being a little bit confused by it. That is to say, people who are trans using that term or uh, who are gender fluid in addition to people who are, let's say, lesbian, you know, what, what's your take on the use of that word? Well... You're just full of the hard questions. <laughs> um, no, I think, I mean, I do. I, I come from, you know, an academic background where I took courses on, like, queer theory and things like that. So I've been around the use of that word in so many different contexts. Um, and I do, th I, I find it to be really powerful. I find it to be powerful because um, so many of the other words that we use are a little bit more limited in what they define, although, again, that's changing with, with every day, but um, for me personally, you know, I identify as a female, and I am married to a woman who identifies as a female, and so the word lesbian you'd think would fit for me, but I, I don't know why, but the word lesbian just doesn't ever make me feel exactly right. It doesn't seem to, to fit who I am, and that's because of my own, my own experience with that word, but the word queer to me means a lot more than that. It, it speaks to me um, more more than just to my sexuality, but just to the general way that I operate in my day-to-day -day life. That, you know, I'm not necessarily, I don't feel limited by um, some of the discourses in society, whether that be heterosexual or cisgender or, you know, even, even things like, so many times when I think of the word queer and how expansive it can be, I think about a friend of mine who um, lives in Virginia and rides freight trains um, as a mode of transportation and also as a way of, of having fun. And it's this totally underground uh, society where they have timetables and they can find the trains and ride on those trains. And um, there's something to me that's inherently queer about the way that he lives his life. He identifies as a man, he's married to a woman, but he lives really outside of the grid that I think a lot of us are expected to live within. And so to me, that's my understanding of the word queer. And I think that it's really great for people to be able to access a word that doesn't have very stringent uh, demarcations. Right. It can be a little confusing, but I kind of think that's the that's the fun of it, and that's the positive things that are happening with the like reclaiming of that word. Right. Uh, but it's so personal, you know. It's also personal. It is personal. You just brought out, I think, a, a really interesting connotation of the word. That is to say, that it is subversive. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Undermining uh, stereotypes or conventions, and I think that is very uh, powerful. But I think it's a very mixed bag when you try to reclaim words, uh, you know, like the use of the word nigger. Now, some people think if you're white, you don't even have a right to comment on that. But I'm not sure that that is really, you know, Nick with the A-H on the end, that that is really the most positive way uh, 
you know, for people to refer to themselves. Uh, and there are other words too, you know, like queen is is used. Uh, and so it's you know it's a very complicated topic. And uh, wondering what your audience is interpreting uh, when you, when you use those words. And I think also you know of the of the, the religious right haters mm -hmm. of the community. Uh, that will latch on to absolutely anything, and there's just a, a constant echo chamber of hate from that group. If you go on Right Wing Watch, for example, it, it, every single day there's some sort of an atrocity. And so I do think we have to be mindful of, of audience when we use these words, but you make a very powerful case for, for uh, the use of the word queer as, as a powerful uh, term. How about when it's applied to gender with gender queer? What, what is your feeling about that? I mean, I think you know, just to comment on what you were saying a moment ago, I, I do think that it's also really important when we use the words to be respectful of the, of the people around us because if I were in, um, in a room and I used the word queer and somebody in that room came up to me and said, you know, that word really makes me very uncomfortable. Um, you know, 30 years ago that word was used to hurt me extensively and there's no way for me to detach those feelings from that word. I would respect that person um, and their experience and I would not use that word around them because I, I think that it is really personal. Um, but in terms of, you know, using queer to attach it to gender, I, I mean, I think gender queer to me makes a ton of sense. I know that if you're not familiar with the term, term of course, it, it might not make any sense, but gender queer just meaning that you know, you're not necessarily identifying within the gender binary. Again, you're talking about being, subvers being subversive and, and breaking outside of a mold that is pre-existing and I think that for that for that idea it's really powerful. Uh, and, and you know, gender queer is a word again that it's confusing because if I say I'm genderqueer and the person sitting next to me says they're genderqueer, we may mean two completely different things. But, you know, that's that's probably great. It's probably better if you have to have a conversation about what your identity means than if the one term just you think answers all the questions for you. <laughs> but, you know, maybe the confusion is a good thing, too, because I think part of the message is that the bifurcated view, uh, that simplistic view of sexual orientation or gender identity just isn't true. It's not true to people's experiences and that our experiences of ourselves are, are self-validating and how we describe ourselves is entirely up to us. But to your point, I think we do have to be sensitive about audience. And so people who are a little bit older may well have been, almost certainly will have been, hurt by the use of the word queer. And so uh, the whole purpose is communication to, to begin with. And uh, I think we just need to be sensitive to that. And, and uh, you and Danielle, uh, certainly are. I'm just amazed at how on point you are uh, with the advice that you give uh, almost every single time. Uh, have you ever felt after giving advice that you said something that you wish you hadn't said and then you had to go back and change it? Have you ever followed up in your communication with, with somebody who asked you a question? Yeah, um, we have. And actually, I think it's hard for me to remember the specific incidences, but I'm almost certain that the majority of the times, there haven't been a ton, but the majority of the times that we've posted something and then followed up the next day or later that day with some clarification or um, more of our thoughts has been directly related to gender. Um, talking about gender is really, really tricky. Um, neither Danielle or I identify as trans. Um, obviously, we both have experiences with gender. Um, we all, you know, anyone on the planet does, but because of the fact that we don't identify as trans, um, it, it can be limiting to how much we can speak on that. And we've had a couple of occasions where we've said something that we didn't realize was, um, uh, you know, possibly offensive to certain people. And, and Tumblr is a very, very vocal community. Um, and so they let you know right away if you've said something that's upsetting. And in the majority of those cases, um, when we looked at what they were saying, we were like, well, damn, they're they're absolutely correct, and so we use it as a tool to sort of expand that dialogue and expand the conversation. And and since since all of those you know um, incidences happened, Danielle and I have grown a lot as people, and we've also grown our panelists out, right? So now we have um, three different trans writers who address issues that we feel will be better addressed by somebody who is within the trans community. So, uh, but yes, we do we do readdress issues sometimes. Yeah, so you've expanded uh, your resources to include quite a few other people I, I see. Um, do you edit what they have to say or do you just let them give advice? 
No, we very rarely edit. If we do, it's, you know, um, one of our panelists, uh, her name is Erica Lynn, and recently she answered a post. I don't even know if it's posted yet, but if it isn't, it'll be posted in, in a week or two. And uh, she let us know when she sent it that the question was very complex, and so she had to um, write a pretty long answer. And so we looked at it, and we just sent it back to her with a couple of sentences that were kind of, they, they didn't necessarily need to be there. They weren't really discussing the gender thing um, at all, and had her look at it. And then she sent it back and said, this is totally fine. I approve. So we never edit anything. We usually don't edit anything, and if we do, it's always sent to the writer for their approval um, before it posts on the site. It's, it's, I mean, that's kind of the whole point of the project is that we're giving the voice to these other experiences, not to, not to alter them in any way. Right, not to control it, but to just allow these points of view uh, to live and to be communicated. Mm -hmm, exactly. Well, that's really, to me, the whole spirit of what you're doing and one of the reasons why it's just so successful. You have such credibility. Uh, you base your advice on the truths that you've learned in your own lives and the, the authenticity that you have and, and you're just making a tremendous contribution. So thanks so much for spending a little bit of uh, time with me today and sharing. Uh, again, you have a Kristen Russo with a new project coming out in the fall, an advice book, and Everyone is Gay, which is just a tremendous resource as well as the Parents Project along with Danielle Owens Reed. So thanks again, Kristen. Great talking with you and have a great day. Thank you, you too, and thank you for all of the work that you are doing and continue to do. It's been a real pleasure. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.